Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hine. Uh, welcome to today's uh, program. I'm going to press on in the book of Ephesians. I uh, have really enjoyed uh, just doing a read through of, of the book of Ephesians and want to press on with Ephesians chapter four. Now that we're done with the first three chapters and looking at the great and glorious uh, accomplishments of Christ in behalf of his people whom he chose, uh, who were chosen by the Father in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blame before him and by grace and how Jews and Gentiles are together in the church there in Ephesians chapter three and so many other uh, amazing, wonderful, incredible um, rays of light that God shines through his word into our hearts. Ephesians chapter four really begins the application section, although there's still there's still quite a bit of teaching and quite a bit of um, positive teaching stuff here. But this really begins the application uh, of what was done in Christ. So and just press into Ephesians four, verse one. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Okay, there's uh, one of my children. Hey there, that's Lily. Hi, your dad, she says. <laughs> um, thanks for being here, sweetheart. If you have your Bible, open it to Ephesians chapter 4. And so we're going to look uh, at, just keep pressing on here. Hey, everybody. Hey, Jesse. Hey, Jonas. I, there, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Okay, so the exhortations to live a godly life in Scripture are always therefores when it comes to paul's epistles when it comes to understanding grace it is in view of the mercies of god it is it is in view of what jesus christ has accomplished we are to walk in a manner that's worthy of that calling and we don't walk in a manner worthy of that calling in order to be saved or or to maintain our right standing with god or any other such nonsense that destroys christianity completely uh, we we live in a manner that is worthy of the calling with which we were called in order to show our gratitude to God for his saving grace. So Paul begins, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. All lowliness and gentleness with patience, with long suffering bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, that's an important a little block of text there. We are to walk in a, a manner that is lowly. Uh, Jesus himself described himself as, as gentle and lowly in heart there. And um, let's see, where's that, that passage? I, I am uh, gentle. That's uh, Matthew 11, 28, I think. Matthew 11, 28. Yes. For I am, um, I am gentle and lowly in heart and then ephesians chapter 4 is really calling us to be just like him to be gentle and lowly in heart now if the incarnate son of god uh, who whose glory is veiled and who is the eternal infinite and unchangeable god in his being wisdom power holiness justice goodness and truth can be lowly then surely we who are clods of dirt from the ground into whom the lord breathed the breath of life uh, we can be lowly too um, and we need to work at that. We need to be lowly. We need to not regard ourselves uh, more highly than we ought. And we need to put others before ourselves and to be gentle. We need to be gentle with one another. Gentleness is something that I'm not very good at. I uh, never have been very good at. I have to work on constantly. And we have to do this with long suffering, with patience, bearing with one another in love. That's something in every local church. This in church was no different from every other church uh, that's uh, out there today. Uh, we are to bear with one another in love, and we're to to be in it with our fellow church members and our, our local churches, be in it for the long haul, and love one another, and bear with one another, okay? Bear, bear with one another's sins, and bear with one another's shortcomings, and uh, make every effort, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, that's not always going to happen. And the churches, uh, we're told throughout Scripture, are going to have problems. They're going to have problems with false doctrine and uh, wicked and evil people that will stand up and be divisive and will, will speak perverse things to, to draw away disciples after themselves. But those that know and love Christ are to live their Christian lives bearing with one another in love for each other in the local church, endeavoring to keep that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace.
he goes on in verse four, there is one body and one spirit. And this is really, really him saying, here's why you need to, you need to work to be united around the truth because there's only one body. There's one church. There's one body of Christ, not one local church, but there's one church in the world. Okay. There are, there are not two churches or three churches. There is one church. It's one body of Christ. And there's one Holy spirit who indwells every believer, no matter where they go to church or whatever, just as you were called in one hope of your calling Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay. So there's one Lord Jesus Christ. He is the same Lord of every single Christian person. There are not classes of, of people. There's not first class and second class, third class. There's not Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians. We are all one in the body of Christ because there's only one Lord that, that unites us all that saves us. And there's one faith. There's one system of truth, one system of teaching and doctrine that's given to us in scripture. And there's one God, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And so it's God's will that his church be united. Now, sadly, it's, it's not. And there are factions and there are, there's heresies that, that arise and there's false teachers and there's, as the scripture says in second peter chapter two um that uh, those that, that rise up in the church that are um, false teachers will have great success that many will their shameful ways uh second timothy chapter four you know paul said there, the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine so you got to watch out for all this stuff but you are to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace because there's one god one faith one baptism there's one church one spirit one body okay and the god there's one god one father of all who is above all and through all and in you all verse seven but one of us grace was given according to the measure of christ's gift therefore he says when he ascended on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men now this he ascended what does it mean but that he first also descended into the lower parts of the earth he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heaven all the heavens that he might make all things and he himself gave some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers now we would maintain that apostle and prophet those are extraordinary offices that are revelatory uh, and what they they do the apostles were vehicles through whom divine revelation came to the church and they, they needed apostles at that time before the the deposit of faith was in scripture bible and the new testament books there are prophets who could give direct revelations from god we don't have those today we don't have apostles or prophets today and the the reason that we don't have apostles or prophets today in this sense uh, it's actually a lot more simple than people think. The reason we don't have apostles and prophets is we don't need them. God always gives his church what it needs. It doesn't need apostles. It doesn't need prophets because it doesn't need any more revelation. We have it all. We have it all in scripture. And we have the Holy Spirit. And God gives some to be leaders and pastors. We, we do, do need those. And I would maintain evangelists too. And that was something that in the relatively recent past, uh, had to study that some and um, became convinced that evangelist is still an office in the church. It's not a miracle working office, but there are some who have that special calling uh, to be evangelists. And that is kind of what they devote themselves to. And they, they really kind of lead the way um, for the local church to be evangelistic and to uh, do outreach and things like that. And then there are some who are pastors and teachers. One thing that you got to you got to catch here uh, in this block of text, this is a very important section of, of scripture here in Ephesians chapter four is that pastors and teachers these are these are gifts of jesus to his church okay ephesians 4 11 he himself gave some to be pastors and teachers and so i was thinking i've thought about that a lot through, through the years i've been thinking about that some lately if jesus give the church good teachers it's not going to have any if Jesus does not give wise and discerning men who love the word of God, who understand the gospel, who, who really work hard, not just to be understood, but work really hard to make sure they're impossible to be misunderstood. Okay. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said that I read that. And um, I think it was in lectures to my students. He says, brothers, do not labor. Um, don't labor to be misunderstood. 
labor to make it impossible to be misunderstood. <laughs> okay, so you don't you don't just want to be understood. You want to make it as hard as possible to be misunderstood. Okay, and people that create confusion and people that um, are co you're constantly wondering what they're really getting at or what they're really trying to say. Those shouldn't be teachers in the church. Men like that should not be teachers in the church, plain and simple. So Jesus is the one who gives those men to the church that it needs and to lead the church, to teach in the church and to shepherd the church. They are gifts of the Lord uh, to the church. And that's that's a hard thing to think. I mean, that's a hard thing to think about. I, I had a seminary professor that really pushed us. He's like, guys, <laughs> those of you that will be pastors, you are gifts of God to the church. I just thought, wow, that's kind of it's kind of hard to even think that I'm a gift of God to the church if, if I'm a decent minister of the gospel. Um, but he said, he asked us, that professor, do you guys see your boy that you are special handmade gifts of Christ to his church? And we all kind of looked at each other like, yeah, I hear what you're saying. That's what that is what this passage is saying. But boy, it sure is hard to think of ourselves that way. It really, it really is. Now, some people really do think that they're God's gift to the church. <laughs> And um, that, that's probably, those are probably the ones you want to watch out for. Okay. Um, so he gave some to be pastors and teachers. And then verse 12, for the equipping of the, for the work of ministry. So the pastors and teachers and these offices that the Lord gave the church evangelists, I think are supposed to equip the people in the church to do evangelism. And some are pastors and teachers. They, they equip the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so the more you preach and teach, you want to see people building each other up and encouraging one another, studying God's word together, learning together, uh, learning together when there's sorrow and there's there's hardship and, and there's loss and rejoicing together when things go well for people. That's what you're, you're aiming at in your ministry. You're hoping to see service to one another in the body of Christ uh, from your preaching and teaching ministry. In verse 13, here's the goal, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So the thing that you you want to produce is people that have discernment, people who are not children in their understanding, but are mature in their understanding so that they are not tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. You think, you know, to be a Christian, to be a pastor, I've had to train myself to, to do this over the years, you got to think darker of people. You got to think darker of people. And I, I hate to have to do that. And you want to think as well of people as you possibly can. But you also have to be ready to recognize that there will be people who will be traitors, who will be turncoats, who will have cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting and trickery, the trickery of men. And you think, man, that's a that's a rough thing to, to, to think about. And that's going to make church life hard at times. But it happens. It's going to happen. OK. Um, all right. Let me, let me well, there's a, a lot of folks talking over here in the channel. Let me just just uh, check real quick and see. Um, 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 um. Oh, there's one of mine. There's Paul Garvey. Happy Thursday. Mom, me, mom and Gigi and Hannah. <laughs> all right. That's OK. That's OK. Um, yeah, no servants greater than his master. I'm an evangelist in my local church. That's great. Uh, whoever New Reformation Apologetics is, that's great. And uh, may God bless you as you hopefully ignite some evangelistic fire there uh, and get people to go out with you and, sh and try to teach them how to do street witnessing and, and talk to people and pass out tracts and things like that. Um, I do that not, not as often as I'd like to. Um, I'm not very good at it, but there's folks here at church that are they're really great at it. They're really, really good at it. Um, so that's great. You know, praise God for that. Okay. Mason. O, listen to your video on JV Fesco's word, water, spirit book, like three or five times. That's great. Yeah. Been thinking about it ever since always wondered about Romans 4, 11 and the pre-law covenant. Yep. 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 
thank you for all your work, sir. You're welcome. Um, and uh, J.B. Fesco's book, Word, Water, and Spirit, is outstanding. The, 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 there's a section at the end of it uh, that is on pedo baptism, on infant baptism. That's one of the best sections I've ever read. That's actually that's why I did that video. I wanted to read that because it's so good. Okay, I thank God that he has such grace that he allows us to be his instruments. That's right. Amen. It, it still blows me away that God could actually accomplish something good through the likes of yours truly. But he does. It's pretty, pretty cool. Okay, uh, therefore, let no one boast in men, uh, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos. That's right. That's right. It's all of the Lord. Um, it's all his show. And at the end of the day, we are tools. We are instruments in his hand that he does what he wants to with. And one thing that I was taught when I was in seminary that, that really stuck to me as well, Richard Belcher, the guy that taught Isaiah through Malachi, uh, he told us, guys, you got to know that in your evangelistic work and your preaching and teaching ministry, there will be times, there will be times that God uses your ministry, uses your preaching to harden people on purpose. And I remember thinking, because we read Isaiah 7 and, and it says that, I thought, wow, yeah, that's true. So as much as I want to see people come to Christ and I want to see, you know, people do better and be more sanctified, there will be times that God, for his own praiseworthy purposes, uses what we're hoping will save people's souls and bring people to Christ and soften hearts. God may use our preaching ministry for a season to harden people because he wants the church or something like that. Just remember, our, our duty is to be faithful and accurate. You want to be faithful and accurate and to be godly. You want to adorn your profession of faith in Christ with good works and try to be godly. And none of us do that perfectly. And all of us have sin and regret and all kinds of things we wish we could undo. But that's always the goal is we want to do that uh, so that Christ is glorified and so that he gets all the glory for anything good that, that ever happens um, in our lives and our ministries or anything like that. Okay, so you, you are aiming at people who are mature. So verse 14, we're no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. So always remember that men have tricks. <laughs> okay. Um, that, that term kubea that's used there uh, means dice playing, deception, okay? Because dice players sometimes would uh, cheat and defraud their fellow players. People do that in the church. <clears throat> A lot of times people you wouldn't think, people you wouldn't expect uh, will do that in the church. The trickery of men, cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And really people plot and scheme. They have, they have diabolical plots. Yeah, they do. Verse 15, but, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That's what every evangelist and pastor and teacher wants to see. You want to see the body of Christ grow. Now, sometimes in order to grow, um, parts of the body of Christ uh, are going to um, be hardened and leave. Okay, and that's part of the process, the sanctification process. Jesus used that illustration in John 15. Um, he prunes his church. He prunes the vine uh, from time to time. And that's a, a thing that he does that. But the thing that you're aiming at is that people um, speak the truth and love and grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body, the edifying of itself in love. So the thing that you're aiming at is that people would be mature. And notice this is again and again. Um, Scripture does not emphasize church growth and how big your your ministry or, or your influence is. It's always about faithfulness. It's always about the the godliness of the individuals that profess to know Christ. God is the one who takes care of of growth. We're just supposed to do evangelism and do outreach and um, do what we can to spread the word. But God has to do all that other stuff. And the ministry of the church, the ministry of the church, is to build up those that really do know Christ. And the thing is, if the ministry of the church is faithful, the um, unbelievers will leave. Unbelievers will leave. 
And I think it's important uh, that people realize that the preaching should be very offensive. The preaching ministry of a church is very offensive to non-believers. I mean, think about what we're saying. If you don't repent and believe in Jesus, you're going to burn in hell for eternity. You're going to be in conscious agony for the rest of eternity. World without end. It never stops. And that's either going to convert someone eventually, um, or they're just going to get mad and leave. And we... That's the way it should be. Apostates and liberals and unbelievers should not be able to sit in a church year after year after year. The gospel is really being preached and the law is really being preached and they're really hearing the truth. It should either convert them, alert them to their unconverted state, or make them so angry that they just walk away. But Jesus said, Luke 6, 26, woe is you when all men speak well of you. If you're a minister of the gospel and everybody always likes you and everyone just thinks you're wonderful, and I just wonder, you know, are you really preaching the, the truth there? So, oh, um, let's move on here. Uh, verse 17, this I say, therefore, he's moving into another application. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Wow. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness. You think, what, is, what does that mean, lewdness? It means unbridled lust, licentiousness, lasciviousness wantonness outrageousness shamelessness okay their past feeling they don't even their conscience doesn't work at all anymore and and paul is saying here you ephesian christians that is the life from which you've been delivered okay do not walk as the gentiles walk if you're really a believer and the lord has done all of this for you don't walk like the gentiles walk in the futility of their mind and notice that there's so much that's tied to, to the way we think. If your mind is messed up, and if your mind is full of garbage, and if your mind does not think accurately and faithfully about the world around you, about yourself, about God, about grace and sin, and what your duties are, and your mind doesn't have the priorities of God, you're going to walk in a way that your understanding is going to be darkened. You're going to be alienated from the life of God. And if you're a Christian, you don't want to be any of those things. You've been changed. You've been delivered from that. You're not ignorant anymore. It says that the non-believer walks like that. He he walks in unbridled lust because he doesn't know God, because he's ignorant of the life of God. He's alienated from the life of God because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, they've given themselves over to lewdness, to outrageous unbridled lust, just pursuing everything that's evil and wrong to work all uncleanness with greediness. And then he says, but you have not so learned Christ. That's supposed to be true of you anymore. That's the life that you lived before you came to know Jesus. That's the life you lived before the old man died with Christ. You have not so learned Christ, Ephesians 4.20. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, I, I love this illustration, you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts <clears throat> and be renewed the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to god and true righteousness and holiness you know my one of my older sons is uh, has started his own business and uh, he does a lot of of work he, he does all kinds of stuff and it's like kind of a construction maintenance kind of painting stuff he does everything like that he has a, a really nice big huge pickup truck with a logo on it and he just works i'm so proud of him he works really hard all the time and he just really really is out doing and just a really really uh, taking names and doing doing great work but the poor kid comes home he's a he's, he's 20. He, the poor young man comes home filthy all the time just filthy and uh because he's actually taller than me um he can wear some of my old jeans and he'll come home and he'll be so dirty and muddy I'll, I'll be like son you need to go take the the jeans off on the back porch we have an enclosed back porch i'm like just leave them back there and then you know take off don't bring all that mud into the house 
And there were a couple pairs of my jeans that have been sitting on the back porch or in the backyard. I'm not kidding you. For like three months, they've been back there. And they're so filthy that it's just, un it was unbelievable. And I finally was like, you know what? I think I can still, I can still um, <laughs> salvage these jeans. So I went out there and th there was mud just crusted all over them. And as I'm back there whacking these against the the uh, wood and against the um, the concrete, trying to get the just get all the hard crusted mud off of it, I was thinking about this illustration here. You put off the old man that that grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Your former conduct. It's like those jeans that are just caked with mud, that's dried on there, baked in there, and I scraped off all the mud and used my hands and my fingernails and just just those jeans all over the backyard just it's like i'm against like uh, pieces of wood on the back porch and got all the the mud off and put tons of soap in the into the uh washing machine and they're they're still not completely clean but they're wearable again but i think that's kind of the thing you you, you never do get the filth all the way out you never you never the old man has never gone completely that's why this is an ongoing process you keep putting off the old you you put off the old, put on the new, put off the old, put on the new. daily thing, and it's something that we have to grow in as we walk with Christ. And as more sin is revealed to us, we got to fight against that sin too, and fight against this sin too. And here's a new habit I need to start. Here's something new I need to get going with. Here's something that's got to be part of life now: the contemplation of divine things and godly conversation with with uh, other men in my life or. Uh, getting together with groups there's a there's actually there were uh four of us uh, there, we were supposed to have five but the fifth uh, flaked out on us at the end but we we meet for pizza once every couple weeks and we split a couple pizzas and we bring our westminster confessions and we read through it out loud together at that pizza place and we talk for an hour and then we pray for each other and it's great it's great that's putting on the new man you need to have habits like that where you can converse about the things of God. It's very edifying to do that. And if you don't do that or you don't know how to do it, you need to learn how to do it. And you got to you gotta sit and talk to people and you got to pursue the Lord in all those ways. So put off the old, put on the new. Again, you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct. The old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Why is that there? Because the old man is still alive in some way. Yeah, he died with Christ, and yet it's like he's still there. And he wants to corrupt you still. The old version of yourself wants to lie to you, the deceitful lusts. And here, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Just like Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, in view of the mercies of God, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service, and that you be transformed. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You got to think correctly. You got to put away false ideas and put away errors, and you got to think clearly and think correctly about the things of God. You want to be renewed the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man. You put on the new man, which was created according to God and true righteousness and holiness. Again, that passage there, Ephesians 4, 24, is, is cited um, about man. Man was created in God's image um, in righteousness and holiness. And with a true knowledge of God, with true righteousness and true holiness. And that's the, the goal there, is once we're converted, once we know Christ, you just are going to have a constant pattern of putting off putting off the old and putting on the new. I mean, if you were converted a, a little bit older, you know that you didn't suddenly think exactly correct about everything. It was a long, it's been a long process and the process doesn't stop until you're dead. You have to constantly be challenging the way you think about things to make it biblical, to make it according to God's thoughts, not the thoughts of the old man that's growing corrupt according to the deceitful, the lying lusts. And I just want to encourage you, always remember that when you have lustful thoughts about whatever it might be, lustful thoughts for, for money, lustful thoughts for like cars or, or, or covetousness or lustful thoughts uh, about sex and things like that, they're always deceitful. Your lusts lie to you because they will not satisfy you. They will leave you low. 
leave you feeling dirty, guilty, sinful, evil. So those corrupt lusts that the old man tells us about, they are lies. They're deceitful lusts, verse 22 says. Verse 25 goes on. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. So put away lying. Don't, don't lie to each other. Do adults do that sometimes? Yep. Don't lie to each other. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Isn't that interesting? Don't steal, work. Don't steal, work. Verse 29, here's a good one. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. You know, there, there's there's been some um, some uh, brouhaha of uh, reform y- young reform ministers that think it's cool uh, to really walk the line as far as cursing and, and what they write and what they say. and they'll try to say, well, Paul Paul uses the word scubala, which refers to excrement. Yeah, when he's talking about uh, his own righteousness before God, yeah, it's excrement, it's rubbish, it's dung. That's not Paul using a cuss word, okay? We're not supposed to cuss. We should not cuss or curse or swear like that. We're not supposed to do that. Now, I'm sad to say I learned how to do that at a very young age. Um, I, I went to the public schools and played sports stuff, and I learned how to – I learned all those words at a very young age, and it's a, it's a vice that's still with me, and I have to really try to watch myself with that. But the Scripture is very clear. The Holy Spirit says – don't let corrupt words proceed out of your mouth. Okay? Do not let rotten, putrefy, that's actually what the word sarpas means. Don't let rotten words come out of your mouth. Don't let dirty words come out of your mouth. But only what's good for necessary edification, things that build up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You see that? When we... Act according to lying lusts, deceitful lusts. When we allow a putrefying, dirty words to come out of our mouth, we're grieving the Holy Spirit of God who has sealed us for the day of redemption. And then these great last two verses. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God and Christ forgave you. I mean, there's just poetic beauty in all that, isn't there? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God and Christ forgave you. Okay, let me see what else people are saying over here. Nice piano playing, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just felt like hearing that, that hymn, and so I sat down and played it. It is well with my soul. Mad Max, I like what you said in your sermon, The Binding of Satan. Good. There's only two types of people, the people of God and the people of the devil. That's right. There are no fence sitters who haven't made up their mind. <laughs> it's your other, in Jesus' thinking, you either are of God or you're of the devil. He, he told those, those religious Jews at the Feast of Tabernacles in John 8, you are of your father, the devil, and his will you want to. And these are people that traveled there for the Feast of Tabernacles. These are folks that probably would have taken some pride in being close to God and religious or whatever. If Jesus told them the truth. You guys aren't religious. You don't know God. In fact, you're children of Satan. And that's one of the reasons they really, really, really didn't like him because he told them what was true. Okay, just a couple more comments over here in the the chat thing. This reminds me of Jonathan Edwards' sermon on thorns that choke the word. Hmm, I haven't actually read that one. Protesting apostasy for uh, your Ian Paisley and other free Presbyterians chat. Okay, cool. I bet that's interesting. Um, 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 um. Unfortunately, I understand that all too well in the Marine Corps. I was around that stuff all the time. Yeah, as far as cursing and swearing and stuff, it, it's hard. Uh, J.C. Ryle uses a really good illustration that I've thought about a lot. He said uh, to young men, if you come across a sin in your life, you know, some kind of a vice in your life, and it's small, like a little sapling, a tree that's a sapling just coming out, sticking out of the ground, 
you can reach down with two fingers, you know, with your thumb and your finger and pull that sin up and throw it away. But if it sits there and grows for 30 years, a hundred grown men pulling on it can't get it out of the ground. Now think about some of the sin that got deep roots in my early life and how it's, it's like, it's like that. It's not a sapling that I can pull up and provide. It's like a giant oak tree with 50 foot roots in the ground that I, it's going to take a lot more work and it's a lot harder. If you attack sin and deal with it while it's little, while it's small, while it's a little sapling, it's a lot easier to deal with it. If it gets its claws real deep into you and gets roots real firm, deep down in the ground, those sins can follow us for the rest of our lives. And everybody has them. Everyone has besetting sins that are their particular difficulties. And that, that's where we stand our ground and fight the hardest. Okay. So just listen to those last two verses one more time. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God and Christ forgave you. So we want to have compassion and grace for each other, and yet be firm and uncompromising too when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the great doctrines of the Christian, because that is what the faith is. Okay, so that's Ephesians chapter 4. I got uh, some other things I've got to get done today. I'm almost done with my sermon. Preaching on the resurrection, the, the significance of the resurrection, the importance of the resurrection. i um, really excited to do that on Sunday. And we'll be hearing from John O'Rourke in the evening. He preaches on the, uh, the second and fourth Sunday nights of every month, so it gives me a little more time to do other things, uh, which is one of the reasons I've been doing a little more of these, uh, put, trying to put up more videos and stuff. But Love you all. Thank you all for being over there and, and for your contributions. I uh, appreciate everybody. Um, I get emails that are encouraging. That, that just means the world to me. And um, thank you all for watching or for listening.